Jinx was relieved when Ned finally emerged from the elevator cage with the Italian crew. He walked his bike over to join Ned in line at the water pump. Ned removed his miner's hat, revealing his sweaty hair and white forehead against his otherwise soot-blackened face. He eyed the two men arguing. What are they going at it about? Something about the direction of the vein, Jinx answered. Seems the coal vein took a turn it shouldn't have, and now it's going the wrong way. I think the geologist is about to get the boot. Oh, well, Ned said. Let him argue. Where'd you get that contraption? He asked, motioning towards the bicycle. Shady won it last night's poker game. Want to take it for a spin? Can't. Ned pumped fresh water and washed his face and hands. My legs are aching to be stretched after being cooped up for eight hours. I might just run from here to Erie and back. Several other miners stood around waiting for their weekly pay. Benedito, you're working too much, Mr. Borrello said, using his Italian nickname for Ned. Study, learn, you go to college. Yes, sir, I hope to go on a track scholarship next year. Good, good, he patted Ned on the back. You run hard and study harder. You'll not have to go to work underground to feed your family. Man was not meant to spend his days in the dark, eh, Venezia? Mr. Venezia wiped his face with a handkerchief. Si, si, un inferno ego, he answered. Si, si, it is a hot one today, Mr. Boreal answered. He patted Mr. Ven Venezia along and then whispered to Ned and Jinx. He speaks no English. These mines, they keep us in the dark in more ways than one. Just then, Lester Burton, the pit boss, stepped among them and nailed a notice to a post near the water pump. The letters were big and bold enough to be read from several feet away. By way of public notice, American Defense Society warning, every German or Australian in the United States, unless known by years of association to be absolutely loyal, should be treated as a potential spy. Be on the alert. Keep your eyes and ears open. Take nothing for granted. Energy and alertness may save the life of your son, your husband, or your brother. The enemy is engaged in making war in this country, transmitting news to Berlin and spreading propaganda and lies about the condition and morale of the American military forces. Wherever any suspicious act or disloyal word comes to your notice, communicate at once with Fred Robertson, U.S. United States District Attorney, Kansas City, Kansas, or the American Defense Society, 44 East 23rd Street, New York City. Burton turned in the sun-splotched face to the men. In wartime, that spy could be your neighbor, the chump sitting next to you at the pool hall, or even at church, he looked straight at Ned. Could be anyone of unknown or, un or questionable background. Be alert and trust no one. Got it? There was a stir among the crowd, mostly men asking for a translation from the few who could speak English. Good. Burton fanned a stack of envelopes. Borelli, he called out. Servito. Vincencia. One by one, the men took their pay and drifted away like shadows. Gillen. Ned stepped forward to receive the last envelope. Burton held out the envelope only to pull it back as Ned reached for it. So, you plan to go to college, eh? That's right. Looks like studying's going to be a tight squeeze working double shifts. Sir? That's right. There's been a bit of a mix-up. We need to dig out a new room and we trobs out with a broken leg. You'll go in for him. But I just worked a full shift. Strong kid like you shouldn't be a problem. I suppose we could call in your old man. I recall seeing an unpaid balance at the Hadley Gillen account on the Devlin Mercantile. He might want some extra work in case a payment in full notice comes due. Think about it. Burton handed Ned his pay envelope and walked off. That's not fair, Jinx said. There's lots of folks who could fill in for Wintraub. Why does he want you so bad? I've beaten Devlin's son too many times at track meets. So what? His son has everything else going for him. Money, privilege, family name. Yeah, and that kind of person doesn't like to get beat by a person of questionable background. Ned's voice shook with emotion. Forget about him, Jinx said. 
Let's go down to the fairgrounds later on. I hear there's a fella selling all kinds of fireworks. Selling, Ned said, opening his envelope. As in money of which you have none? He stared at the contents in disgust. And I guess neither do I. They work us like pack mules for 78 cents a ton of coal and then pay us in vouchers for the company store. It's no wonder we can't, we can't get out from under their thumb. He crumbled up the envelope. So unless they're selling fireworks at the Devlin Mercantile, we're out of luck. I didn't say we were going to buy any. We're just going to look. Once we see what goes in one, we can make our own. We'll have fellows all over Crawford County buying our fireworks. Not in the mood. Come on, where's your spirit of adventure? Ned slowly buckled his belt and pick around his waist. It's buried 150 feet underground. Maybe I'll start working triple shifts. Then I can buy a piece of that coal vein and somebody might have a little leverage against Devlin. Suit yourself. But I did see Pearl Ann Larkin trying on a fetching hat at the millery store today. Big pink thing with feathers. She waved at me through the window. Ned shrugged, opening the lower chamber of his miner's lamp and dropping in a small handful of white cubes. He turned the knob to the chamber above, allowing a few drops to, of water to hit the cubes, creating a gas that rose to the top. Nick flicked the flint, starting to flame. Donning the hat, he said with a smirk, Big pink thing, pink thing with feathers, huh? If it doesn't come with a carbide gas light, I guess I'm not interested. She said something about looking forward to sharing some popcorn with you tonight at the carnival and taking a ride on the carousel, but I guess that doesn't interest you either. Ned adjusted the flame and shined it in Jinx's squinting eyes. She said that? Sure as I'm standing here. And I happen to know you've got 40 cents at home. Ned sighed. This shift doesn't end until 6 o'clock. Jinx smiled, knowing he had won. I'll meet you at the fireworks booth at 6.30. Ned studied Jinx under the light of his helmet. What are you cooking up, Jinx? The last time you were this interested in my courting Pearl Ann, I ended up smelling like a glacial skunk. Jinx straddled his bite. By the time you're done working two shifts, you'll smell plenty... You'll smell plenty without any help from me. So be sure to wash up, he called as he pedaled off. The autumn night was cool. Henson's field just outside of town was aglow with hanging lanterns strung from one booth to the next. The county fair was a welcome time for all. Farmers had finished harvesting their soybeans, milo, and alfalfa and had planted their winter heat. The kids had a break from school. Folks from neighboring towns stepped in to sample a variety of foods. The Italians baked everything from cannoli to ziti. The Swedes served up braided bread and hard-packed pretzels, while the Germans and Australians touted their strudels and mm, baroques. Jink spotted Ned and handed him a calzone. Compliments of Mama Satoni. She said you had to work two shifts. Gracie, Ned called to the large woman, his mouth already full of bread and cheese. Eat, to eat, she insisted, her arms deep in dough. Come back, I have enough biscuits baking. I keep them warm for you, yes? We'll be back, Chink said, leading Ned away by the elbow. A few booths over, a placard read Jasper Hinckley, Pyrotech. The exuberant Mr. Hinckley worked a crowd of young boys who apparently had plenty of money to spend. There you go, lads. And remember, be careful with fire. Once you start it, fire works. The boys ran off, leaving Mr. Hinckley to laugh alone. He smoothed the handlebar mustache covering his upper lip. Just a little pyrotech humor, gentlemen. What can I do for you today? See here, you've got your Shanghai uh, Sizzlers, Sparkling Marys, Chinese color changers. Jinx picked up a red cylinder behind the rest. What's this one? Easy there, son. Mr. Hinkley took it from Jinx and gently replaced it with several matching red cylinders. That little fella's not for sale. He's a Manchuri fire thrower. They're ones that shoot upwards of 300 feet in the air and explode in two different colors. Jinx hooked his thumbs in his pocket. What do you take us for, mister? A couple of schoolboys 
You expect us to believe that these here cans shoot up in the air and explode in color? Mr. Hinckley looked bewildered. That's exactly what I'm telling you. Haven't you ever seen fireworks, boy? Jinx stuck out his bottom lip and spoke with a fiend country bumpkin accent. Well, mister, we may look stupid, but that's as far as it goes. I bet there's nothing more there than them beans in them cans. Mr. Hinckley took a medium-sized canister and cranked off the lid. You see that there powder? That's pure TNT. Mix that with a little potassium nitrate, sulfur, and charcoal, and you got the beginnings of a first-class shell. Jinx looked sideways at Nell. Sounds like quite a recipe. But even if you can get it off the ground, and I'm not saying I believe you can, how are you going to get it explode into the air? Now that's the trick, Mr. Hinckley gently reached into the canister and exposed a thin fuse. This little fella, he starts burning when the shell goes up. When he's all used up, kapow! You got yourself a mighty fine py pyrotech display. That's fireworks in layman's terms. He put the lid back on the canister. Of course, you got to be a bona fide pyrotech to handle these little darlings. I apprentice with a full-fledged Chinaman up in Omaha. Jinx nodded and crossed his arms. Well, you do seem to know your trade. Fine. Now, which one of these quality specimens would you be interested in? Keeping in mind I don't sell the Manchurian fire throwers. Those are only for official pyrotech displays. Jinx looked over his shoulder. Uh-oh. Isn't that Mama Satoni calling Ned? Ned took his cue. Oh, yeah. She's keeping those biscuits warm for us in the oven. Sorry, Mr. Hinckley. If we don't hurry up, those biscuits are going to turn into firecrackers. Just a little humor from one pyrotech to another, Jinx called as he and Ned walked off. Mr. Hinckley smothered his mustache as a new group of boys crowded around the stand. Jinx and Ned wandered past the few booths of carnival games where vendors tried to attract the attentions of passerby. Step right up, toss three balls in a hole and win a prize, or try your luck in the shell game. Win a Liberty Head silver dollar. So much for your big con, Jinx, Ned teased. A con is merely the art of distraction, Jinx studied the booth. Come here. Jinx grabbed Ned by the elbow and led him to the shell game. A man in a third a man in a striped shirt and a bow tie smiled a crooked smile. A tiny monkey perched on his shoulder. Ready to try your luck and win yourself this here Liberty Head dollar? It's an easy game. I'm practically giving away money, right, Nikki? The money twink Sorry, the monkey twittered his agreement. Ned shook his head. I'm not into wasting money, no thanks. Come on, Chink said. It only takes a dime and you can win a dollar. And then you can buy Pearl Ann a bag of popcorn and eliminate with your spare change. Ned grimaced and placed a dime on the counter. The man lined up three walnut shelves and placed a pumpkin seed under one. He shuffled them around. Ned kept his eyes on the shell with the seed. And when the man stopped, Ned tapped it. The man uncovered the seed. You got a good eye, Ned was jubilant. So, hand over the Liberty Head, silver dollar. Ah, uh, you don't get it on the first try. It takes three chances, and each one costs a dime. Go ahead, give him another dime. You're good at it, Jinx coaxed. All right, Ned grumbled, reaching for another coin. Again, the man revealed which shell held the seed and shuffled them back and forth. Again, Ned tapped the correct shell. Woo-hoo, Ned shouted. This time he didn't need any coaxing. Pleased with his success, he already had his third dime on the table and waited for the last game to claim his silver dollar. Again, the man shuffled and Nell watched, Ned watched as the shell with the seed went left, then right, then around and ended up the middle. The monkey hopped onto Ned's shoulder and twittered with excitement. Hey, little fella, you know you got a winner when you see one, don't you? Ned reached up to tap the middle shell, but Jinx stopped his hand. Not that one, this one. Jinx moved his hand to the shell on the right. But I was watching his not... Mm, this one, Jinx said firmly. 